Dr. Alan Wade about restoring dignity in an unjust world. Dr. Wade discusses social responses, particularly he touches on how a person who has been abused may be further traumatized by the social responses received from people who one perceives as a source of support. Dr. Wade provides training and supervision to forensic and human service professionals and conducts original research on institutional responses. For example, courts, family law, media, criminal codes, child protection, to diverse forms of interpersonal violence. Alan discusses how absent positive social responses and the language you use to talk about assault can impact the victim in very negative ways. It's really nice to be with you and uh, wow chaplaincy. Uh, I, had a, I had a look at your uh, website and I looked at a few. It's, it's very impressive. Uh, you've done a lot of really wonderful work, so I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you. Uh, I work primarily as a service provider, so a family therapist. Uh, my background is in family therapy initially and um, Fairly early on in my career, um, I started, uh, for reasons unknown to me really, I, I started to become more and more specialized and interested in the problem of interpersonal violence, uh, broadly defined. So racism, uh, sexism, domestic and family violence, uh, sexualized violence, child sexualized abuse, and so on and so forth. And I, I became, I came to this interest uh, largely through um, trying to come to terms with my own police and the colonial machinery, if I can put it that way. Um, I was beginning to, I was working a lot with indigenous people in Canada or starting to do more of that and learning more about the history that I was very much a part of, but knew nothing about really. So I, um, I started to read my old high school history textbooks and university texts and, um, you know, re learned that, I, like so many other people, had been quite blatantly lied to. And so that, that really began a process of working with other people, trying to understand um, the connections between uh, colonial violence and domestic and family violence and sexualized violence, especially against Indigenous people. And so I, I was working as a therapist, seeing victims of armed robbery, uh, gang beatings, various other forms of violence, and working with them as they prepared for court. Um, I learned from the prosecution that some of the people I'd seen m became quite good witnesses in court, which was interesting because we never talked about the court process. But I, I think what we did talk about was their, their responses and their history of resistance to the violence. And I think that kind of cleared the way for people to give a more confident and more factual description uh, ha of what had happened in their cases. And I was then really fortunate to meet uh, a number of uh, colleagues and uh, uh, do a PhD in, in social psychology specializing in microanalysis. Microanalysis is a kind of a subfield of psychology where you try to break down social interactions in, in, into their very minute parts and look at the connection between hand gestures and vocal intonation and body posture and uh, eye gaze and turn taking. Uh, and so you, when you apply that level of detail to instance of, instances of interpersonal violence, when it's appropriate to do so, um, you begin to see levels of, of detail that are not necessarily obvious. So that allowed us to see in a lot more detail, for example, how people would resist armed robberies. And that allowed us to ask better questions about how they managed to respond so carefully and prudently in the manner in which they did, even though they were terrified. So that led to a certain kind of way of working. And um, because we started to focus on resistance to violence as part of our uh, way of talking with people. But at that point in time, there was very little in the uh, therapy literature about that. Mostly victims of violence are portrayed as, you know, passive or as affected or as impacted so we began to really study the connection between violence and language with my colleague, Linda Coates, and um, court documents, uh, judges' reasons for sentencing, um, textbooks, psych psychological and psychiatric reports, and to look at how violence was obscured 
um, through the use of both ordinary language and professional language. So we've been combining those things and really trying to improve responses to violence uh, in every institutional system. That's, a, that's the big enchilada, that's what we're ultimately working for. Individual resistance um, by, even by children who are being sexually assaulted and abused. Uh, a little eight year old boy, you know, wearing three pairs of pajamas when he went to bed at night. Uh, refusing to eat what his abusive uncle made for him for dinner. Refusing to call him uncle. Refusing ever to have his photograph taken with his uncle. Very subtle clandestine, um, incredibly spirited and uh, prudent responses and forms of resistance. So we use the word resistance on that individual micro level, but also what we're seeing now, of course, this outpouring of uh, resistance to colonial male supremacy um, and the widespread killings of blacks, uh, African Americans, and of course, also uh, the widespread uh, killings of other racialized groups. And, and in Canada, uh, in particular, um, as in Australia, um, indigenous people as well. So the, these, it's been incredibly inspiring uh, to see this collective defiance of a state apparatus that's uh, working hard to uh, suppress dissent and, um, and maintain the old order as it were. Uh, it's extraordinary to see the energy that people are bringing to it, the passion that people uh, bring to it the insatiable desire for dignity and justice and how that is happening and catching on in, lar uh, in large groups um, over many nations. It's extraordinary to see, isn't it? I think one of the things that uh, is extremely important is that people have the opportunity to uh, sort of realize and talk about and express their own agency, their own viewpoint, their, old, their own worldview not only their own suffering, but their own indignation. And so many, many people who have been subjected to violence have, have really never been given the opportunity to speak in the voice of resistance. And that's, that's important on an individual level in the context of a therapy interview. Uh, it's important on the level of uh, broad public discourse. Uh, and it's, on the, it's, on, it's important on the level, collective level, so when people are able to experience themselves as engaged in active, prudent, determined, courageous opposition, no matter how clandestine that is, um, it can restore a sense of dignity. So in violence, whatever else it is, is an affront to the dignity of the human being. It's a humiliation of dignity. And we can compound that humiliation by portraying the people who are harmed as passive or as dysfunctional. And there are many ways in which this is, uh, this is accomplished in, in uh, our kind of industrial society, capitalist industrial uh, white supremacist society. Um, part of it is psychiatric systems are used to do this. Um, it's, done through, um, uh, it's done through criminal codes. Uh, it's done in all kinds of institutional settings. So when people have a chance to rise up and experience themselves as collectively dissenting, I think a certain kind of healing can come from that experience. The other thing that's happening, I think that's very interesting, as you were pointing out to me earlier, is that what is coming directly uh, under view and, or coming more, has been pushed more forcefully into view is the extraordinary problems with our public institutions uh, in terms of how they respond to the problem of social injustice. It, it goes beyond, it goes way beyond policing. Uh, concerning first responders, it's, it, it's really important that you mention that. I mean, one of the things that we notice is that with many first responders who we do debriefings with, uh, for example, uh, I met with um, a couple of, uh, happened to be men a couple of weeks ago. They attended a horrible uh, motor vehicle accident. One person happened to be at the scene, wasn't on duty. The other person was on duty and then arrived. And they discovered they were both first responders and they had a, a very quick interaction together at the scene trying to save lives. They were unable to do so. Then they wound up coming to uh, a critical incident debriefing and, and uh, I wound up speaking the, to them together deliberately because they had worked together. And one of the things we tried to focus on is how they communicated so carefully and so efficiently in such a short period of time. So 
that gave them the opportunity to talk about how they could see the other person knew what they were doing. And they, they had a common language and they built up a certain level of trust with one another almost immediately. And then, then because one of the bodies was horribly, um, horribly injured and, and exposed as people were coming around, it was extraordinarily the efforts they made to protect the dignity of the person who was dying by concealing their body, telling other people not to come too close to come into view. They were so mindful of the dignity of the people that were injured in every possible way. It was, it was absolutely beautiful. And they hadn't had that conversation really before about how they take care of the dignity of people as they do this incredibly difficult work. But I think it's most fitting that so many people now, for example, in England, you know, staying on the balconies and clapping at eight o'clock, um, but it, it's so appropriate now that we attempt to uphold the dignity of those first responders and acknowledge uh, everything that they've been doing. So that's, that's one level. The other is um, so many people who have been harmed by violence have had also beyond the violence, negative institutional responses. They've had terrible experiences with people in positions of authority, whether that be police or judges or counselors or psychiatrists or school teachers, whoever it might be. And there's a, a lot of research that shows, as you may know, that the quality of those institutional responses from others actually better predicts the level of a person's distress than does the severity of the violence itself. That, that's extremely important for us to take account of. So there is a great deal of work going on to um, reform uh, public institutions. In Canada, we have a tremendous disc discourse now opening, opening up about not only police reform, but uh, the reform of the way in which the government fails to police extracted industries, uh, which work to extinguish indigenous land rights in Canada. I know that in Australia, you just have had a, a horrible case of Rio Tinto, um, you know, blowing up um, a sacred uh, Aboriginal site. If, if that was a, you know, if that was a Catholic church that they had blown up without permission, you know, people would go to jail. So this is coming into, into the view of the, of the general public and being responded to in a very passionate way. And it's, it's, a, it's about time and it's, it's good to see. And I think um, I have some hope that uh, we can achieve meaningful change. And I see more people in leadership positions in these institutions opening up to that. Before we go any further in our conversation with Dr. Wade, let's get a general understanding of what the bystander effect is. Social psychologists Latani and Dali popularised the concept of the bystander effect following the infamous murder of Kitty Genovese in New York City in 1964. The 28-year-old woman was stabbed to death outside her apartment at the time, it was reported that dozens of neighbours failed to step in to assist or even call the police. Yeah, um, it's often when you look in a very micro way, people are doing things that um, are not necessarily noticed because so much of our social interaction with one another is so rapid uh, and so subtle, we, we can't even really remember it five minutes later. So I... Um, the original case, the Katie Genovese case, which where the bystander effect was kind of mm. created, that terminology was created. Uh, it turns out that Katie Genovese's brother who went to war and became disabled uh, through war injuries after, he made a film uh, reviewing the events at the time. And in his conclusion is that really nothing like the bystander effect took place. That people were more involved in trying to figure out the situation than was, than was originally acknowledged. I've had that experience as well. I had a, a journalist call me not so long ago about a, an incident on a subway train in Toronto, Canada, where uh, a man on the train, immediately after the train took off, uh, started yelling and screaming and becoming very aggressive at people. And it looked, it was very dangerous. So I was, I was talking to a woman, a journalist, who, who was on the next car to that one, but could see into it and could see the man, you know, uh, couldn't hear him, but could see him madly yelling and gesticulating and could see the other people sort of sitting back. And her question was to me, let's talk about the bystander effect. So I just said, look, could I just ask you a little bit more about the situation? 
So when you looked into the next car, what were people doing? And she said, well, they were just sitting there, they froze. I said, well, hang on, as they were freezing, were they looking at each other? And she, and she said, well, yeah, they were checking in with each other. They were all looking at each other. I said, right. And so did any one of them move? And she said, well, there was one young guy who sort of made a move toward the man who was yelling, but then a man beside him kind of held him back. And then I noticed the other people nodded at him, kind of like, yeah, thanks, that's what we need to do. And then what happened? And she said, well, there's a woman beside me in a wheelchair. I happened to be, you know, she was in that area of the car. And she said, pull the, the cord to, to call for an emergency. Now, how did she tell you this? Well, she pointed, she kept pointing up at the cord. And finally I looked, I pulled the cord. After you pulled the cord, what happened? She said, well, then the people in the other car kind of backed up and they sort of looked at each other and they seemed to relax a little bit because they could tell someone was coming. So it, once you started to look at the micro level, it was an instance of instant community. It wasn't a bystander effect. People coordinated very rapidly, very efficiently and competently to manage the situation so that it didn't get worse. So many of these situations, there's a lot more uh, subtle interaction going on to take care of one another than we might at first see. Exactly. And there were people that intervened at the time. There was, there was Mr. Floyd's friend who had been in the car. He intervened and he tried to stop it. Another person came by and said, well, he can't breathe. Even one of the police officers said to the, uh, the, the main perpetrator who had his knee on Mr. Floyd's, he said, well, he, he, shouldn't we turn him on his side? And other people were asking questions. So there were people trying to intervene, but you had four men with weapons uh, st standing there allowing it to happen. And that's a pretty powerful inducement that tells people you have to be really careful here. And of course they were right. What would have happened if someone had intervened and dragged that police officer off of Mr. Floyd? <laughs> so these are situations in which there's no good choice. So people attempt to, to do what they possibly can uh, to, to address the situation. But to see them wholly as bystanders, I think is to miss some very important uh, parts of what people actually try. Just reminded of a story where uh, a police officers I knew in the north of Canada where they were working in a very remote indigenous community and um, others, they were at a gathering, which was a healing gathering. There, there had been a rule that there was no drinking at this gathering from the community itself, not by the police. But the community had asked the police to come to just try to be around and provide safety. And because they wanted to try to change the relationship with police so that it would be better. And so this one man started drinking and getting out of control. And uh, one of the elders gestured to a police officer, please come and intervene. So he did. He came over to the gentleman. He said, uh, hey, hey, Floyd, or, no, Floyd, that's a bad choice of name. But hey, <laughs> hey, Robert. Um, listen, uh, there's no drinking at the gathering. How about you hop in my car and I'll take you back to your house? And Robert said, no, I'm not getting in your fricking car. So he said, okay, I'll tell you what, how about I drive to your house by myself and I wait for you? And Robert said, okay. And he walked over to, over to his house. And when he got to his house, he said, thank you, man. Now that's dignified policing. He, he could have escalated, but he thought, what is it, what's going to allow this man to save face in this context? And if we're thinking about those things and you know, the same cop talking to him, you know, when he puts someone in the back of his car with cuffs on, before he gets in the front to drive away, he comes back and he checks, hey, are those cuffs too tight? Are you all right? I, much of it is little things like that, uh, that, that people can learn are important. Can those things be taught? Absolutely. People do them every day. In fact, we, we begin learning them from, we begin learning them in the first 48 hours of life, really. Do we? Yeah, there's tremendously interesting research on turn-taking be, uh, between neonates and mothers. Mickey Rosenthal did a beautiful uh, paper about this in 1982, I think, where she filmed in infants and, and neonates and mothers and noticed that, of course, when the mother called, the, the baby would look around for the mother and then squawk. And when the, the baby would squawk and look around for a mother, then the mother was more likely to look at baby. When the baby talked, mother would talk. When mother talked, the baby would talk or squawk. And so they began a rudimentary turn-taking system within the first 48 hours. And some people argue that that's the beginning of moral action because it, it involves reciprocity. It involves, when I call, you respond. 
when you call, I respond. I make mm -hmm. room for you. you, you make room for me. So we learn how to do it from a very early age. In fact, we have to be taught not to do it. If you, if you look at the curriculums of the professional groups uh, that respond in cases of violence, so school teachers, 35% of children who probably, depending on the jurisdiction, experience violence as they transit the school system, medical doctors who make a lot of diagnoses in various countries of mental health problems, psychiatrists who you know, begin as medical doctors, psychologists, social workers, etc. cetera. Um, if you begin to look at the, the training curriculums that they receive in school, how much training do you think they get on understanding interpersonal violence? Hot enough. Very, very little, almost none. I talked to a group of PhD right. psychologists last week, 12 of them, PhDs in psychology, and I asked them, how much training have you had specifically on interpersonal violence? The different forms of violence, how they're functionally linked, how they're connected to structures of power and privilege, how they're connected to political economy, how, they, how one form of violence enables another, how people respond to and resist violence, et cetera. To what extent have they had any courses like this? And, and the answer was none. We had one textbook. And yet we all know that the single best predictor of whether or not a child will one day get a diagnosis of having a mental disorder is whether or not they experience violence in childhood. So really it is like we have created a medical school with no, cas no courses in cancer or diabetes. Who makes these decisions that young, you know, that young child protection workers should come out of school with very little training in interpersonal violence when 85 to 90% of the cases they're going to be involved in involve violence? So it, it just makes no sense whatsoever. So that's one place we really have to think very critically about the way we educate people who become involved uh, in the in the professions, but at the same time, what we're what some of what we're seeing here is that women's organizations, who in many places are funded on a shoestring, and uh, are, have to constantly fight for refunding year after year after year, mm -hmm. rather than receiving base funding, for example, um, are having to be incredibly creative uh, to find new ways to create safety, pop up shelters, uh, different kinds of phone trees, different ways of making connections uh, in, in a private way, because COVID um, for many people, unfortunately, has increased conditions that are favorable to people who use violence. Social isolation, uh, the lack of social contacts, um, you know, the lack of contacts with uh, just moving about an outward society where people might notice. So the preoccupation of police and others with other kinds of social problems. So we've, there have been rapid increases huge increases in levels of violence against women and children over this time period, including increases in murder rates. It's about ending violence. It, it's about uh, promoting a, a socially just world. And as um, fanciful as that sounds, and the fact that it sounds fanciful is, is actually the problem, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So I think we have to get a lot better at addressing all forms of, uh, of inequality and promoting justice across um, all of the interfaces um, where people are involved. So in order to do that, you have to look really baldly and directly at what violence is and how it works. Who perpetrates violence? Who's harmed? How do people respond and resist? What do our people who lead our public institutions need to know about how to respond appropriately? So that will lead to, that will lead, have to involve, in my view, that will have to involve, for example, changes to our criminal codes just to pick one uh, mm -hmm. avenue, because our criminal code in Canada transforms violence against children into sex with children. So does your criminal code in Australia. Mm -hmm. So the, the, these crimes are talked about as though they're sexual in nature. So at the same time, we're funneling incredible rates of violent pornography into the lives of boys, into the lives of all children. And we know that it's harmful. The average age at which uh, uh, boys in North America begin viewing porn is 11 and a half. And we know that, that viewing that kind of violent material is associated with sexism and attitudes that are supportive of sexualized violence. I see boys at 12 and 13 who have raped their younger sisters after viewing porn. So the government of Canada has thrown up its hands as though this is some sort of normal uh, psychodevelopmental, this is how sexuality is developed. And of course it's not. So 
you may have, you may have noticed that at the beginning of COVID, you may have heard the story where there were people trapped on cruise ships, and one of the U.S. based porn companies decided that it would be good marketing to offer people free porn, free access to their website, because they said, uh, you know, at a time like this, people really need to sort of they really need to have more human contact. So what we're doing is portraying profound humiliation of the human spirit, prof profound humiliation mostly of women. What we're doing is portraying that as sexual contact. So we need to be a lot better at understanding the distinction between violence and sex, for one thing, uh, and making sure that that is reflected in all of our public institutions. So those are some of the things that I think that we can be doing. There are initiatives underway uh, to do this. There's you know, wonderful organizations like Talita, uh, in Stockholm, who has been helping uh, you know women escape human trafficking. Um, your own there's a, a great organization in um, uh, in Sydney, as you know, called Domestic Violence Services Management, who we've been working with, and they've they've really been working with us to sort of develop materials, educational materials. Um, your own Kate Alexander, who's the with the Office of Senior Practitioner Child Protection. I think that organization has been doing really innovative work and upholding dignity under the banner of dignity driven practice, we're seeing meaningful changes so that people who experience violence will have the opportunity to speak about their responses and their resistance and have that acknowledged, and have their already existing capacity and desire for justice at the center of the picture. The, you know, um, there's no way in which uh, an 11 year old child, an 11 and a half year old boy will understand the nature of the material, the context behind it, uh, the incredible exploitation of the people in the images, primarily women, the economy behind it. There's, and, and they're told that this is what men want. So they're watching oral gagging at age 12 and they're being told that this is what men want. And they're incredibly confused um, by this, un understandably. And it is a, in my, in my opinion and the opinion of many others, it is a very serious international form of child abuse that masquerades under the banner of sexuality. For our governments to fail to take decisive action to protect our children is one of the most profoundly harm, harmful abrogations of their responsibilities than I can think of. So why not start by boycotting all hotels in Australia that provide adult content in hotel rooms? That's a very good suggestion. And that's somebody who works in that area saying, well, we can think outside the box. We, we can create movements individually. We can do something. Yeah, of course we can. Yeah. Thank you, Alan. I, I, you know, I could talk to you all day. So we can tell no, we've, gone, we've gone over time.